Decades La Salle, the institutional podcast of De La Salle University. For this episode, we have a maverick who is responsible for some of the most iconic shows in Philippine history. I'm talking about TGIS, Encantadia, Mulawin the Movie, and most recently, the live-action series Voltus V Legacy. I'm very excited to speak with Direct. Mark A. Reyes. Hello, Derek. Hi. <laughs> Welcome back to Taft Avenue. <laughs> I haven't been here for a decade, literally. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Because uh, uh, the last time I was here, we had a special occasion for the communication arts. They uh, they uh, gave us a special recognition for the outstanding alumni of the of the course, and then so that was like 10, 15 years ago. And Derek, Mark, you graduated 1991. 91. Yes. <laughs> and you come from a, a legacy also because uh, uncle, <laughs> of course, yeah. Jose Javier Reyes, yes. also from, from De La Salle University. Uh, I want to highlight your roots because, mm -hmm. of course, before we jump into uh, much of your work that we have enjoyed, I have enjoyed personally also growing up, especially TGIS. Uh, what was your first play or your first start? <laughs> uh, well, I started with Harlequin Theatre Guild. Uh, of course, we started doing original plays, and then uh, one of the plays uh, that I wrote was Circle Reunion, and then Dr. Isagani Cruz saw it, and he requested me to translate it to a, to tele, to a teleplay, and then it was shown uh, for Balin Tatao. So that was my very first professional gig as a writer. And the rest is history. And the rest <laughs> is history after that, yeah. Now, I have to ask about TJIS, because this is not just, I guess, uh, a coming-of-age series. I would say that no other uh, franchise or series has equaled it in terms of them being the zeitgeist, no? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was a teenager also when, <laughs> when it was uh, being aired, but, but please take us through that time. <laughs> well, so I graduated 91, that was 93, 94. So I was fresh off the bat. Uh, I started doing uh, uh, telemagazines and musicals, you know, for for ABS and uh, and uh, ABC Five back then. And then uh, I was I was able to get into Viva Viva Films Viva Television, and then they had a slot for GMA, and then it was a free slot. Uh, it was an afternoon slot, and basically it was a slot for traditional soap operas. There was nothing for teenagers at that time. And then the challenge was to come up with a talent building uh, kind of show that will showcase the talents of uh, Viva back then. And then uh, hopefully they transcend and they become big stars. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the plan. So they gave it to me. They said, okay, think of what you can do. And then back then, what was popular was Melrose Place, Friends. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, what's inherent in Filipino culture is the barcada. Yes. You know, there, there's no even there's not even a word, a proper word in English mm -hmm. for barcada. Mm -hmm. You know, group of friends, peers, but, but not nothing quite. like yeah. yeah, right. The barcada <laughs> is your second family, basically. Uh -oh. So that's what I thought of, you know, and then it was every Saturday that usually my friends would get together after school and we go on gimmicks and stuff like that. So I said, this is the best idea I had. And then my brother, who's also a graduate of uh, La Salle Taft, is a, is a copywriter. So he, he, he mentioned, why don't you call it ano, Thank God It's Sabado? During that time, the popular campaign was Jollibee, uh, I love you, Sabado. Yes, yes. That one. So we, I call it TGIS. And then there it started, you know, and then uh, GMA people was calling it. I know, uh, the La Salle show. It was so burgis <laughs> daw for the time. I didn't know how to do anything that was masa because I was coming from the culture of La Salle. Then I said, this must be asp aspirational. You know, even the masa would want to see, you know, middle class mm -hmm. uh, kids having, you know, going through their problems in life, having their barcadas, their second family solve their problems, yeah. and all this, you know, falling in love, etc., etc. So the first season, I was really, we were really doing bad. It was really doing bad that they said, okay, I don't think there'll be a second season. You know, I had the audacity of you us telling GMA and Viva, no, you can't cut us off. Give us another season, we'll prove mm -hmm. it to you. And then I realized I was, we were doing a lot of bubblegum stuff. Uh, I said, very shallow. 
uh, storylines. Then I said, okay, let's shift gears. Let's let's do a bit of you know a bit serious stuff. So we shifted. On the second episode of the of season two, that's when it started picking up, and the rest, as you say, is history. It, it became so phenomenal. <laughs> uh, so phenomenal. It be- then there was a movie, mm-hmm. and then there was another spin-off. Growing up, when they were getting too young for a teenage show, we had a new generation, and then we moved up to growing up with more mature, uh, you know, a more mature uh, subject matter. So, so that ran for five years. You know, that's. That's a very long time for a, a TV series to run that you know that that long, and that phenomenal. And then all the you know all, all of them, all most of them started having their own careers after that. Mm-hmm. You know, Bobby, Angie, do they're still iconic. You know, Michael yeah. Flores, and you know so so there. So that was the La Salle show before that. You know that became something really quite I remember big. going to the cinemas to watch the TGIS movie. <laughs> yeah, also. it's my first movie and I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's around the same time as Space Jam, no? Yeah, uh, when we were, when uh, we went to a movie tour, wondering how the movie was going, you know, because there was no social media back then. So we literally had to go to different cinemas to find out how it was going. And then in, in Quad, I remember, uh, Quad Glorieta. Pa, Glorieta now. <laughs> now known as Glorieta. Yeah. I saw the line, I said, oh wow, Space Jam is really eating, eating up TGIS. <laughs> and then when we went nearer, I said, wait, that's not the line for Space Jam, that's the line for TGIS. So I was really sneaking around the cinema. So uh, that was my first indication that it was really going to be a hit. Mm-hmm. And then it ran for a month. Mm-hmm. So we knew that we really had something big. Yeah. And I think most of your career after TGIS, I mean, no one has loved you this, but I personally see you as a fantasy uh, maverick because, of course, Encantadia was another huge yeah. series. Uh, and how did you transition from, of course, something that was very youth-oriented to something that was a full-blown uh, fantasy? Yeah. Well, I'm a geek. You know, first and foremost, I'm downright uh, under like, a geek. I like science fiction. I like fantasy. So um, I, I know I'm one of the high pinnets in the industry that I can do musicals, I can do live shows, I can do drama, I can do action, I can do fantasy. So um, that I enjoy. You know, uh, being a, a fan of Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and all those kinds of movies and films and franchises. So when they gave me Encantadia, again, we didn't know it was going to be a hit or not. You know, but uh, back then, uh, technology for CGI was just breaking, mm-hmm. so we were ride, we were riding the cusp of that. Mm-hmm. So we were having nice special effects, all these, you know. That was way back in 2005, and then that was a hit then, mm-hmm. and then that ran for several uh, seasons. So it's like I think almost two years, and then it ended in 2007. And then it went back as a revival for 2015. So that now it had more advanced technology, so it bo- looked better. You know, the new cast, it was a retelling. That also made it big. Mm-hmm. That was so big that during the pandemic, when all the productions were shut down, they reran that. Mm-hmm. And it was still hitting the high ratings mm-hmm. for a rerun that was unheard of. <laughs> so because of that, my next project after Voltus 5 is. Another, it's a spin-off of, uh, of Encantadia called Sangre. Mm-hmm. So it's the continuing story of the franchise. So Wait. that's how, how successful it is for us yeah. to be still uh, bringing it back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the public still clamors for it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I write something on Instagram about my shoes, for example, and they will ask, when is Encantadia coming back? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's how, mm-hmm. you know, how, how uh, excited people are for the franchise to, come, to go back. Mm-hmm. And of course, I have to ask about Volta's Five Legacy because uh, I must admit, and this is not because I'm right in front of you, when I first saw the mega trailer, I was getting goosebumps and I don't know, I was feeling quite emotional because you know that Ratatouille scene when the critic became a kid again? Yeah. That's exactly oh, how I felt nice when, I heard, when I mm-hmm. heard the official song mm-hmm. and then uh, the anthem of Volta's Five. And then uh, I remember also in a Japan trip with a business uh, contingent 
we actually sang the Waltz Five <laughs> Anthem to our Japanese host, and they loved it. They were like, "Wow, Filipinos really love Waltz Five." And to see you bring it back uh, as a live action, no less, and working with Toei <laughs> for four years uh, or more. More, it's more like eight. It was a, it wow. was a long, arduous. Uh, from conception to production it took around 10 years, mm -hmm. technically. And you yourself were a Voltus 5 fan, no? That's oh, yeah. That's why yeah. you decided to bring it yeah, to the um, uh, I, the, the, the short of the long is that GMA wanted to do it way back then, but they didn't know how to do it. And then I, my name was attached to it because I did Encantadia. So they said that if there's anybody who could pull it off, it's probably Mark Reyes. Then I waited for them to go back to me and say, okay, we're doing Voltus 5. When, it was, when I was hearing nothing, I, I inquired. I said, I heard that there were plans for Voltus 5. What are the plans of the network? They said, we feel that it's, you know, it will not be possible to do it at this time. You know, uh, it might be expensive. The, the, the effects might be bad, blah, blah, blah. I knew back then that we could pull it off. So in 2014, I, I produced my own pitch tape. I heard about that around 2010. Mm -hmm. It took four years until I finally said, I think it's time we, we can do this. So I produced a pitch tape on my own that I presented to GMA, to Toei, and to Telesuccess, the local franchisee. And then that's, that's how it got started. When they saw that it was possible, it took another eight years to, to have it approved, licensed, and then ready for production. And then the wonderful pandemic hit. <laughs> so it was the worst kind of production. It was so complicated, so expensive. Close set. Close set. Now we had to do it through a pandemic. You know, so it was so difficult to do, to achieve. Uh, I'm glad it's over. And then uh, it came, literally, it took us two years to shoot it. Two to three years, technically. And then it came to the point that we started in the pandemic. At the end of the pandemic, we were still shooting, you know. Because we were asked to do an extension of two weeks, so there. So that's uh, never in my lifetime can I imagine that I will end up shooting in a pandemic. I guess for our audience who are curious about what the pitch tape is, that's uh, how anything gets executed in the entertainment world. <laughs> you have to create uh, a pitch, a deck, a tape to show a producer or you know the owner of an IP mm -hmm. <laughs> intellectual that you can property do it and, yeah proof yes, of concept correct yeah. and of course uh, Toei is the owner of the Voltus 5 uh, mm -hmm. intellectual property yeah and they're they're very very happy with with the uh, the result you know like you were talking about the mega trailer the mega trailer went global uh, that Toei was so surprised that it not only in let's say Japan did it become popular around the world. I mean, all, all the reviews for the mega trailer, because that was released internationally. Uh, unlike the series, there's a geo lock, so we can only watch it in the Philippines and through GMA Pinoy TV in some territories. Uh, so for the, for the response to be like that, you know, we basically said, hey, the Filipinos can do it. Mm -hmm. So that's hence because of how successful that was, we were invited to San Diego Comic Con. We were the first uh, Filipino uh, live action series to be invited for San Diego Comic Con uh, held this year. So that's another feather in the cap of the production that we were able to present to the world what the, what the Pinoys can basically do. And it's 90 episodes. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's no small feat. No, no. <laughs> to, give a, to give people idea, it's usually just once a week, you know, in different territories. But here we are doing it every day. That's for economic reasons mm -hmm. because it's so expensive that to generate enough funds or income to pay off for what the network spent, we had to do it five times, you know, five times a week. And you had a whole army of visual artists. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh, to wow. execute it. Yeah, we had two vendors or basically two suppliers. One is uh, in-house, GMA Video Graphics and Riot Inc., uh, who did. Uh, all the CGI effects. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you mentioned in an interview before 250. Oh yeah. And 100. And so all Pinoys. You know, we're 350 proud. artists. Artists, yeah, wow. and we're proud to say it's all Pinoy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's a 100% uh, Pinoy-made production, from scripting to 
uh, set design to costume design, execution, and CGI, all Pinoy's. Mm -hmm. You've been doing this for decades, Derek, and I'm sure you've been asked this question. Uh, there have been comparisons no, um, between Philippine entertainment and the likes of Korean entertainment, mm -hmm. which has really seized the world and dominated for recent you know, history. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And what else do you think, uh, are you hopeful for, for Philippine entertainment? Well, the major difference with, let's say, Korean uh, TV production or film production compared to Philippine uh, production is that it's not a matter of creativity. I mean, we have all the creative people in the Philippines that could handle or go, you know, mano y mano with the creatives of Korea. It's government support. In Korea, uh, they have studios that the government is funding that people who want to produce something can use it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for free, sometimes for a minimal fee. Uh, so the support is there. Unlike here in the Philippines, the taxation, the, the lack of support, the lack of infrastructure, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not around. So even if the, the producers want to spend, like, like Voltus 5 was an exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. You know, it was so, it was something that was driven by passion and driven by, you know, I mean, our generation, to your generation, to down the line, knew of Voltus 5. Mm -hmm. So there was a built-in nostalgia mm -hmm. that will push and propel the, the, the network to say, yeah, we can do it, let's, let's spend on this. But a regular film or a franchise, compared to the budget that we have, compared to the budget of Korea, and their, their, their market is the whole world. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping that the Philippines would end up having that same, you know, kind of, kind of flexibility that we could go out and sell our product to the world, as much as K, K dramas are. You know, they're on yeah. Netflix, they're on mm -hmm. other platforms. You know, we're getting there, but the biggest difference is that the government support mm -hmm. must be there. That you know, less taxation. They provide infrastructure like, you know, uh, like in Korea they have this temple for all the Korean historical dramas. They just use one temple, they just change the dressing, but it's, I, I've been there in the, the uh, NBS uh, studios uh, that they have there. KBS, sorry, KBS, KBS. studios, it's, it's there. So all your big Korean dramas that is historically based shoots there. And it's just standing there, and it's just it's maintained. <laughs> and they have hospitals just mm -hmm. for shootings alone. So hopefully that, that thing, you know, someone or, or, the, or the government provides something like that for Filipino filmmakers and for, for, uh, for television production as well. Correct. And most people don't know that their success is a byproduct of decades yeah. of development. Yeah. <laughs> decades of development. And yeah, they've been doing this for, for the long haul. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, never mind Korea, but Bollywood. India, yes, you know, they, they dish out so much and now there's a lack of support for Filipino films also. So the pandemic didn't help at all. It got worse after the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know. So hopefully the, 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 the Filipinos start supporting local films besides television. And now television is up against streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. So it's really a tough industry to be in right now. Mm -hmm. But I can see that you're still fighting. Oh yeah, and of still course. hopeful. Of course, and never shall we fail. <laughs> and the sangre uh, reincarnation of Encantadia, I can see already that there is so much excitement for it. I mean, when you release the teaser. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, and that was just a post, right? Mm -hmm. So we're starting production there, and then again, uh, we're given the new toys of technology. Uh, so now it will be can only get better. Then the learnings from Voltus 5 legacy will be now transferred to Sangre. So it's going to be, you know, it'll, it'll be more global in quality, hopefully. And hopefully something that we could sell again outside. Mm. As a director, and because you've seen a troop of actors and actresses <laughs> over the years, over the decades, what makes you say that, oh, this person has the X factor? Because a lot of Filipinos admittedly aspire to enter showbiz, mm -hmm. right? Aspire to become uh, one of the talents that hopefully mm -hmm. you might work with. So what is that? What is y you know, it's 
Well, talent, you, first of all, you must have talent. You know, but sometimes it's not enough just to have talent. Uh, you must have the right attitude. I'd rather have a, uh, a semi-good actor in terms of acting, but with a very great professional attitude. I'd rather work with that person than an actor with full of talent, but you know, is a diva <laughs> or doesn't have the nicest working mm -hmm. attitude. You know, uh, but beyond that, for some reason, even if you have the looks, you have the talent, you have the skill, it's something of a kismet kind of thing mm -hmm. that, you know, we can never say who, who will make it big or who will not make it big. It's so different now. It's, it's, it's the right timing. It's the right project. Mm -hmm. You know, you do the right project with the right timing, then you become a big star. Sometimes I know some people who, who, who has the talent, but who's just there, you know, mm -hmm. in the sort of a, in the median mm -hmm. range, but doesn't propel to become a big, big star. So it, it, it's a lot of factors. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, if you have the right attitude and uh, you, know, you train and you, you consider your profession for acting at least as a craft, not just a money-making thing, mm -hmm. there lies a difference. The mm -hmm. people who think of it as a craft, who has that attitude of waking up, that knows his lines, no, is focused on the, the characterization, and if you're running a series, he knows the history of the character and how he relates to the other characters, then that's the one usually that becomes successful. Then someone who just wakes up, who just says the line, and who's making pa cute and mm. does TikTok on the side, then, you know. <laughs> and you've encountered and worked with uh, several entertainers from La Salle. Of course, Kaya Abeliano oh, yeah. is uh, playing one of the important characters in Voltes Five Legacy. What was it like, I mean, to mentor in a way, or? Well, I worked with Carla before Voltis 5 for Because of You. I mean, Carla's one of the most easiest and, you know, darlings to, to uh, work with in the industry. And it, it does, and it, of course, it helps that, you know, she's a, she came from La Salle. You know, there's a kindred spirit kind of thing that once, you know, I'm working with someone who's from La Salle, we have a shorthand on, 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 on how it goes or, you know, that kind of thing. So it was very easy for, uh, with me to work with her. She's a, th she's a thinking actress, you know. She, she will get into her, she's so dedicated in doing her roles and the way she studies her, her script, mm -hmm. you know. I, I guess it's, it's coming from, you know, uh, being in a school like La Salle, mm -hmm. you know. So you, the you, ethic. Yeah, the, the, the ethics, work ethics, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the personal, the social, the religious. So that, it's all in one package. Mm -hmm. And I think I must also highlight that it's a rarity to, to be a Lasallian and a director because most of the directors come from other schools, no? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in mainstream, you know, I could, you could, I could count with my two hands on mm -hmm. who, who are, I hope I'm wrong, but who are in the mainstream right now. But I know there are a lot of young filmmakers coming out mm -hmm. and they're starting to make a name for themselves. So hopefully there are more green-blooded directors that will come out uh, and become successful later mm -hmm. on, yeah. Yeah, I hope so too, especially uh, Calm Arts and also from our sister uh, school, no? Benil yeah, has yeah. been producing a lot of mm -hmm. uh, very talented uh, multimedia artists. Yeah. Give love with Lasallian Giving. Lasallian Giving is a new online donation facility that calls us to spread love for our Lasallian mission. Please visit the Lasallian Giving portal to donate via e-wallet or online banking or go to any of our over-the-counter payment centers to support DLSU. Lasallian friends and alumni may donate any amount to the following projects and campaigns. Scholarships for Lasallian Legacy Fund, Sports, Culture and Arts, Infrastructure and Facilities, this podcast, and and Santuario de la Sal. Leave a legacy, strengthen our animo. Give now at www.dlsu.edu.ph slash give. I should, should have asked Tito who, who, who's in the industry already. I know there are a lot of people outside it. I mean, I mean not, not directors, but um, are you cinematographers or writers? There are, there are a lot. But for directors, nah, yeah, no. Did not he give much. you any advice? <clears throat> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Ever since when I started, uh, that's why I had an edge when I started doing com arts here in La Salle. The our, our professor, I know uh, Amy Perez was so, uh, sorry, Amy Lopez. She was so surprised when she saw me direct, and he goes, "How come you know this already? It's like 
you know, it's like second nature to you. Because when I was younger, I was just in high school, I would watch, go to my Tito's sets mm -hmm. and sit down beside him literally in the OB van and see how he does, mm -hmm. you know, doing camera direction for TV dramas and even in film sets, I'd visit him. So when I got into com arts, I basically had, you know, background knowledge already on how to do things. Mm -hmm. So it was easy for me. Okay. So I remember a lot of people wanted me to be in their group. <laughs> <laughs> I know Walter's Five was a dream project. Are there other dream projects? Uh, um, <laughs> you, you know, that's the, one of the best questions and the worst questions to ask me. And I've been asked after Walter's Five, what's next? Uh, you know, uh, far from uh, doing a, a, a Star Wars project, which is probably next to Walter's Five, but I would like to do as close as possible. Uh, it was hard. Also, basically, I think explore. Uh, so I'm working on some original concepts now, and hopefully, uh, that gets steam and then it gets rolling. So, but that's the, uh, I see that as something as for international release or the local. So we'll see how it goes. Of course, this is an Assault podcast. I have to ask about your time in Assault. I mean, when he arrived here. I said, um, you were saying things, but... Oh, we didn't have any of these things. <laughs> we, didn't have, we didn't have escalators. <laughs> we didn't have a power map center in the campus. That's how, how primitive, you know, that time was. We still had a football field, though, you know. Uh, so, I mean, one of the best times of my life in college was basically having so much fun that, you know, I don't know if it's still relevant now, the flow chart, when I had my flow chart check, and then the the guy who was doing the flow chart said, "Oh, congratulations! You're graduating." I was shocked. <laughs> I it, it, college just flew by because I was home. I was having fun with the Harding Theater Guild. I I I uh, developed and brought home uh, lifelong friends. The Guild, like we're now like Omarik and Padres. I I'm got parents of their children, so they're the first people I call. When something happens to the family, that kind of friendship, you know. Uh, so I was having so much fun in the uh, college, uh, the university, that uh, it just flew by. You know, the next thing I know, I was graduating from it. And Tom Arts, uh, you know, we had we had awesome uh, uh, professors back then, you know. Uh, so it was it was a. Uh, it was very, it wasn't a tough and uh, difficult, should I say, course to take, because it's great, it was a great design. So uh, there's a lot of hard work, but it wasn't like probably, I can't, you know, I can't speak about the majors, but I know that people think engineering or accountancy, uh, you know, it's very tedious, it's, you know, it deals with numbers, it was very redundant. In, in Comarch, you know, you're, you're writing one day, taking pictures the other, and then directing. So it was very valuable, you know. Uh, so it was a, it was a, it was an awesome uh, platform to start your career. You know, now CSP specializing more on on that. So I could tell the the few alumni I get to work with, give them CSP. I see that their level of of uh, their starting point, their career. I see it's very, you know, it's sufficient enough for, for compared to others that I've worked with. Because I guess it's not a you know, so you're really armed already when you get into the world and you're ready for it. I'd like to mention that, because also for now, how do La Salle hits fair in the entertainment industry? Are we ready? Are we still in need of training? But I'm glad you mentioned that how we're professionally yeah. capable of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially now, okay, going back uh, from commerce to CSP. Uh, that's why there's a lot of uh, filmmakers. And then my uncle would basically hire off from his students to work on sets because he sees a lot of potential for the students. And then he's very proud when he sees uh, uh, his students, you know, move up the ranks in the, in the industry. 
So uh, from cinematographers down to writers, so it's very proud. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud also, I'm having popular songs from the South that I get to work with, of course. What would your advice be for someone who wants to make this a lucrative career? Um, you know, hopefully something as uh, long as yours, <laughs> because uh, it's, it's not an easy career. Uh, there are long hours, especially if, you know, a situation like COVID where you are literally in the bubble. <laughs> you I want to switch that again. Uh, take, uh, take your your career, your education uh, seriously. Uh, it's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of competition. Uh, but always keep the passion. I mean, I don't think any future I have or both spine will be a reality if I didn't keep the passion and the confidence and the belief in myself in, in pursuing something. But that's. Once you have the passion and you never let go of that passion, then uh, that will steer you through. Uh, and then, of course, a good education uh, and the knowledge. I don't think for, for someone who wants to direct, people keep asking how do I start as a director. Fine, you have a degree uh, or you're taking a course of directing, either in the South or somewhere else, but you just have to direct. Now, nowadays, everyone's a director. You direct your own TikTok, you direct your own or you edit your own post on social media. So if you want to direct, just start shooting your phone now as a camera that you can start doing films, crazy films, short films. That's how you start. That's how you develop your vision, you develop your style. And once you do that, that's going to go all the way already until you become a, a professional. I'm glad you mentioned technology too, because uh, you know, I've seen people who are something as simple as light, the redheads, <laughs> And then the gels would melt. <laughs> and uh, when the Osram bulb would explode, yeah. into a speck of, of water would drop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but now, again, because of all the advancements, uh, it's literally a thing of your hand. You can create your focus yeah. <laughs> from an iPhone. So what would you say to this generation? Because they have one of these. Uh, yeah, it, everything's, yeah, they have everything, you know, uh, provided to them. So it's a matter of learning on, on, on what style or what, what genre you want to work on. I suggest that you dabble in everything so you know, you know, and then when you're asked to do something that is beyond your comfort zone, you're ready for it. You know, you have to, once you're starting off, you have to accept things that you might not be uh, an expert on. But you're willing to learn and you know uh, develop your skills more. Yeah, you know you can't be you know you can't choose too much. You can't be choosy once you start. You know if there is a job that is offered to you, accept it and do the best job you can do. Uh, you know, I don't want to. I don't believe in saying that fake till you make it. You know, uh, but you have to learn to you know to accept stuff that you're not comfortable with, but you know you can do it. Uh, or you may not like it, but you learn, you might, you might surprise yourself that you end up liking something. Like, you know, I don't want to traumas, but then, oh, you let it pala, and you, you develop something uh, that will become your career. So you have to be open to everything. I love that. The, you know, idea of just step out and just do it. <laughs> and of course, you have to ask about writing. So a lot of people think, Direct is a purely visual responsibility, but it's not. <laughs> Story is your responsibility. Yes. Well, I'm actually I'm a thespian by heart, a writer by profession, and a director by accident. <laughs> when I was starting That would be the line. <laughs> yeah. When I started writing plays in Hurricane Theater Guild, I would mumble like that the record into it the way I wanted it's supposed to be like this, like that. Then my friend said, Mark Schauber, hold up, why don't you just direct? I don't know, maybe I will. Then I did. And the rest is history. So my advantage is that I'm also a writer. So uh, it helps, you know, with, uh, for being a director and to tell a story visually, but at the same time, uh, on their written page, I know what works and I know what just makes it, he thinks needed to be adjusted. So that's that's one thing that's said about pages. Maybe I take the cheese out from my uncle, who's really a writer, then take a director, so then there. So. You have to be, once you're, once you're a good writer, 
or you're going to do a good storyteller, then directing and editing will come in easier for you. With your help. Do you still get stars? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And who are the directors you look up to? Uh, well, I met most of them. Parang yung Lutia Sabaya, Lino Brock I've never met. But I'm in awe of his work, of course, then Ismael Bernal, uh, and, and other other directors. Of course, Hollywood directors a lot. You know, that's where I get starstruck you know, for, for directors or uh, like, Sam Hargrave was here to promote uh, uh, Extraction 2, but I wasn't going to because I was stuck in, the, in doing all the spy. So, you know, so people in the industry, directors, writers, uh, but for actors, yeah, the usual. The usual that I get stars from, but not in local, in part of the segment, most of them, yeah. And you mentioned that you're in San Diego, San Diego Comic Con. Are there other like, textables or conventions that well, are all in your bucket list? Oh yeah, well, <laughs> one bucket list I would want to have is Rainbow to Spy in Tokyo Comic Con. Of course, the motherland of all the spy. So hopefully we get to do that this December. Yeah, and then hopefully we have a complete cast. Because I would love to see how the Japanese would react with them wearing their suits, you know, walking down to Comic Con wearing those suits. Because in, in San Diego, coming on, they were like looking at them, but they're not, the Americans were not familiar with both but only the Asians was reacting to them. So they were saying, who are they? Are they like Asian Power Rangers? <laughs> no, they're not! So, yeah, this predates Power Rangers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, hopefully, Tokyo Comic Con. And of course, I have to ask about the values. Yeah. What are the Nasanian values you okay. think? How can your time? Yeah, well, you know, um, I'm considered as one of the most antiseptic directors in the industry because I just do really cool some stuff like TGIFS, I level, it's fine. You know, um, think, well, you know, I've been in the cell from grade school all the way to college. See, so I guess the, the ethics of the cell, yeah, the Rio Morris Culturas would be updated my my body and mind. So I would never veer away from that, you know. Well, hopefully the Sun Brothers will not disown me. I'm doing a bit that's kinda of edgy coming up. So hopefully they don't get too freaked out about what I'm gonna do. So it's it's a sexual thriller. But it's more on, on on a psychological thriller kind of thing. But but beyond that upcoming project, all my projects, I think uh I'm guided with with the last of education, uh, that you know, I don't do anything that I will not be proud of. Uh, and then, of course, not only in my body of work, but the way I I work and uh, relate to people. I guess that the education is not going to be like others be understanding, careful of God, and all those, because there will become a time that you will be tempted so many things that might be against what you want to do but if you if you have a solid foundation of a good education christian education at that then you'll never you know, you'll never go far to the dark side no. you know? uh, so that's that's what i'm very thankful to myself and the prestige you know i come on let's face it the minute that they know from you're from the south they go oh see so there's this pedigree that we have you know, uh, and hopefully everyone maintains that pedigree or that, that status. You know, no one, or just a few bad apples, but everyone else would hold the colors of uh, the green and white high standards for everyone to, to appreciate. You know, not only in media, but in all other professions. What is your dream for the ends? Oh, I can't go global. Uh, as, as, like what you said, hopefully we become the next uh, Korea in terms of uh, television production. And then, of course, hopefully we can uh, compete with Hollywood later on. So there, you know, and then it's still the elusive Oscar for a Filipino film is still there. So hopefully the younger directors will be able to snag us one. You know, a Lasallian young director will be able to snag us one. 
How would you like to be remembered? Oh, well, uh, maybe I think uh, more or less my legacy has been set already with the three shows, TGIS, Cartagena, and Bolt Spy. I just hope I get remembered for more from this point on. That, uh, like what you, you use the term, magic director, that, you know, so hopefully it will be remembered for that, that I opened doors to some people, inspired other people, younger people to go out of the box and be brave. You know, when they say no in the industry, uh, don't accept it. You know, when they say no, can you say no once now? When you say no again, keep on trying. Keep on trying. So that's how I basically got where I am right now. You know, and I take no for an answer. I take it for once, twice, but you know, it's five times. That's no, not a lot. But you try it until you know, they, they they really shut the door on you. So just be brave, be strong, like you know, despite what they say. So uh, and uh, know who your friends are. Know who the, the good uh, people you work with to develop your own team and the bills. I love that it's not about business. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that maps up for episode. That was a lot. <laughs> I learned so much from you. Thank you so much, Derek. Oh, my pleasure. And we can't wait for something. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. And uh, something comes up big. Uh, I, I'll be glad to come back and share it Thank you. Give love with Lasallian Giving. Lasallian Giving is a new online donation facility that calls us to spread love for our Lasallian mission. Please visit the Lasallian Giving portal to donate via e-wallet or online banking or go to any of our over-the-counter payment centers to support DLSU. Lasallian friends and alumni may donate any amount to the following projects and campaigns. Scholarships for Lasallian Legacy Fund, Sports, Culture and Arts, Infrastructure and Facilities, this podcast, and and Santuario de la Sal. Leave a legacy, strengthen our animo. Give now at www.dlsu.edu.ph slash give.